Good afternoon. We're here from Partick Free Church of Scotland, continuing. Um, we are a local Glasgow congregation ministering in the West End of Glasgow. And we're out here on our weekly open air outreach. And this week we come from Buchanan Street in the heart of Glasgow City Centre. And we're very glad you're able to join with us. We have one or two out who are handing out gospel tracts as you pass by. We would be very glad if you would take a gospel tract. It may well be that you're not able to read it at the moment, but please put it in your pocket or your handbag. And when you get some time, please read it. It contains a very short and brief, but relevant and pertinent a gospel message, and it also contains our contact details should you wish to make contact with us. And we include our contact details in order that you might be assured that we are indeed a genuine local congregation. We are a Scottish registered charity, and our sole aim and goal is to come out and to bring to you the relevance of the Christian gospel to you, even as you pass by. Because we know that we live in a day and in a generation when many people are despising Christianity and they are rejecting the Word of God. And we would contend that you have really no evidence for that position other than maybe someone else has said to you, well, the Bible's out of date, Christianity is dead. Well, we would argue the opposite. We would maintain that what we find in God's Word is relevant to us today, and indeed every age and every generation. And we dismiss it at our peril, because the gospel is the only satisfactory answer to our greatest needs. And our greatest need is to be reconciled to God, to have our sins forgiven, and to be accepted in His sight. And only Christianity in and through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ provides that answer. Every other religion, and indeed there are many, many religions, we can hardly count the number, and they are increasing day by day. But all of them, basically, will tell you to work your way to heaven, whereas Christianity tells you what God has done in Christ Jesus the Lord in order to save sinners. Now, you might be hearing this, and you might be, have heard something like this before, and maybe you are one of those many individuals that we come in contact with who have a sympathetic ear towards the gospel. But that's as far as it goes. They hear some things and they recognize that this is the truth of the Word of God. They recognize that what we are saying today and on other occasions is consistent with the Word of God. We are not making this up, and therefore you have some sympathy towards the gospel cause and the gospel message. But, and it's a very big but, you are basically saying to yourselves, well, I'll give it real consideration later on. I'll think about it. I'll put it to the back of my mind, and when I get a more time and a better opportunity, then maybe I will consider the claims of the gospel at some future date. What does the Word of God say to you this afternoon? Well, we read from Proverbs. That's a book that's mainly written by King Solomon, who in his day was the wisest man that lived. And he says in the book of Proverbs, chapter 27 and verse 1, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, 
for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. What's he saying when he writes for us, for our edification? Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. He is reminding us something that we don't like to be reminded about. He is reminding us about the brevity of time and how we only have today. We only have the now. We cannot tell what will happen tomorrow. We cannot tell what will happen in a week's time, in a month's time, or a year's time. We don't know these things at all. In recent days, many have been rushed into eternity who did not expect to go into eternity. I am sure you've heard of the floods that have come upon Spain. And the last that I heard, some 2,000, 200 people, I should say, at least 200 people have been killed. And they have been rushed into eternity very suddenly. We could think, too, in recent days of our former First Minister. He was away in a foreign land. He was engaged in some activity, some speeching, engagement. Suddenly, he's dead. He's gone. He's no longer with us. He's dead. He's buried. He's in to eternity. That's why the Bible tells us, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. And the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God who came down from heaven in order to provide a salvation for us, he gives us a wonderful illustration of someone who was simply taken up with his world and suddenly he was rushed into eternity and he was, was not prepared for eternity. He tells us in Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, and beginning at verse 15, he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, the ground of a rich of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. He's telling us that we're not to be consumed with covetousness. What is covetousness? Well, it's a desire for more and more and more. We're never satisfied. We want the latest car, the latest product, the latest computer, the latest phone. We want to update things. We're always wanting more and more and more. More money, more pleasure, more property, more holidays, more entertainment. We're never, never satisfied. And he tells us to beware of covetousness because a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things which he possesses. And he gives us a parable. He tells us a story about a certain rich farmer. He was a rich farmer. The Lord had blessed him on many occasions. His ground bore much fruit, and his barns were already full. And what happens? He gets another good harvest. This is what we're told. The rich man brought forth abundantly, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this is what I will do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Now, we can readily identify with this rich farmer. We may not be a farmer, but it may well be that we have worked hard. We already are well endowed, and we're looking forward to retirement. We have a good pension pot, and the time is right for us to retire. And we will say to ourselves, 
eat, drink, and be merry. I have plenty of money. I have everything I need. I have everything this world can give to me. Now I want to end my work. Now I want to live off my earnings, live off the pot of gold that's in my pension, and I want to eat and to drink and to be merry. I want to enjoy my life. That's what the rich farmer said when he got this bumper harvest. I'm going to pull down my existing barns. I'm going to build bigger ones. I'm going to put all my produce there, and therefore I'm then going to relax. I have plenty of life left in me, and I'm going to enjoy my life. I'm going to eat and drink and be merry. But, and here's another big but, what did God say to this man? Well, we find it here. God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? What a wake-up call this man was going to get in the evening. He went to bed satisfied. He went to bed content. He went to bed thinking he was going to get up in the morning and he was going to begin his life of ease, of eating and drinking, of pleasure, and living off his wealth. But God said to that man that night, Thou fool! Why? Because thy soul will be required of you that very night. In other words, that man was going to pass into eternity that very night. And what would happen to all that he had provided for himself? What would happen to all his goods, all his money, all his possessions? He was going to leave them all behind. Everything was going to be left behind. And this man was going to go into eternity. And he was going to meet God. And that's why, friends, we tell you, because the Word of God will warn us and tell us, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. And therefore we want to press upon you the urgency of dealing with God now, of dealing with the salvation of your never-dying eternal soul now, of getting right with God now. That's what's required of us. For today is all we have. We don't know what's going to happen tonight. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Today, friends, the Bible would tell us, today is the day of grace. Today is the time to get right with God. And that's why we come out. We come out and we leave our pulpits behind, and we seek to bring this urgent message to you because we're all going to meet God one day. Now, you might live your life today, and you might not have any reference to God in your life, and you might reject the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ for decades, but you're only de delaying the inevitable. You will stand before King Jesus. You will stand before Him as He appears on His great white throne and you will give account of yourself, of your actions, of your words, of your thoughts. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And that's why the Apostle Paul goes on to say, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And we want to bring your attention to this glorious person. Who is this person we're referring to? He's none other than the Son of God. He is Jesus Christ the Lord, who became the Son of God, who came down from heaven, and He came down on a mercy mission. And that mercy mission was to reconcile men to God, sinful men to a holy God, how could he possibly do that? Well, the only way that he could do that was to die in a room 
and in our place. He is the substitute that God has provided. We read in the Scriptures, and we seek to take all our teachings today and every other day when we come out here from the Word of God, from the Bible itself. And we read in John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. There, friends, do you not see the wonderful love of God? Do you not see the wonderful grace of God? This is the day of grace. This is the day of God's favor. Why? Because we've all sinned, every one of us. We might think we are righteous, but we're not righteous in the sight of God, and that's what matters. We might be righteous in ourselves, and we call that self-righteousness. And we might be righteous as far as, as others are concerned. As far as the judges of this world are concerned, we might well be righteous. And the law of the land has nothing to say to us. Why? Because we haven't broken any laws of this land. But God has given us a law. What is that law that He has given to us? Well, He has given the law that we call the Ten Commandments. And He's given it to us in codified form in the Bible. But more than that, He has given it to us when He wrote it in our hearts. You have the law of God written in your hearts. But because of sin, that law is not as clear as it should be. It's smudged. It's out of focus. It's scratched. But nevertheless, it's there because we're all made in the image of God. God created man, male and female, after his own image, in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, with dominion over the creatures. Yes, friends, you need to realize and appreciate how special you are in a very real sense. Some people would try to tell us that we're just like the animals. Not so. None of the animals are made in the image of God. Only mankind, male and female, we're made in the image of God. In knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. And our first parents, who were they? Adam and Eve. They were created perfectly. And they were perfect. They were pure. They were holy. They were upright. And they truly reflected in some real sense their Maker, made in the image of God. But, as you know, they fell. They fell when Eve was deceived and Adam disobeyed. And they ate the forbidden fruit. They failed the test that God had appointed to them. You see, God has not made us robots. Our first parents, God laid everything on for them. He provided everything for them in order that they might live a happy and a productive life. He put them in a perfect place, paradise, the Garden of Eden, and all they were required to do was to look after the garden. But God gave them free will. You see, God would have us to love Him because we love Him. And God would have us to serve Him because we want to serve Him, not because we must, not because we're compelled. We're not robots. And when the test was applied to our first parents, they fell. The devil, the evil one, the one who's a liar, the one who's a murderer from the, from the beginning, he came and he tempted Eve, and she succumbed to that temptation, and she ate the forbidden fruit, and she demonstrated there that she didn't love the Lord our God. And when Adam disobeyed, he also revealed that he did not love the Lord his God. 
Well, you might well say, what's that got to do with me? Well, it's got to do with you because we've all come from Adam and Eve. They are the first human parents, and we can all trace our line right back to Adam and to Eve. And when they sinned, we sinned. And when they fell, we fell. And when they fell, their nature became a sinful nature, and therefore we have inherited their sinful nature. And that's why when we come out of the womb, that sinful nature reveals itself. It doesn't take too long. And those of you who are parents or grandparents will recognize this. You have children, and you love them, and you provide for them, and you look after them. What makes them misbehave? Is it you? Did you tell them to? Did you instruct them? No. Where did their bad behavior come from? It came from their sinful nature. Where did they get their sinful nature from? From you. Where did you get your sinful nature from? From your parents, and so on, right back down to Adam and Eve. And friends, that's why we cannot please and love and serve the Lord our God because we have this sinful nature and our sins have to be dealt with. And that's why Jesus Christ the Lord came. He came. He was not conceived in the normal manner. It was by extraordinary generation. He was born in the normal manner, but not conceived in the normal manner. And therefore, because of this, he did not have original sin, and therefore he was able to live a perfect life, absolutely perfect, the only one who ever did live a perfect life. None of his actions were sinful. None of his words were sinful. None of his thoughts were sinful. What a person! We've never ever encountered someone like Jesus Christ. Never. But that's our great hope, because He did live the perfect life. And then, at the end of that life, around when He was 33 years old, human nature displayed its wickedness when it crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. The perfect man, the perfect God, they hated Him, they despised Him, they could not have Him in their presence, because His perfect life revealed their sinful life. But friends, this is our great hope. The Lord Jesus, living a perfect life, was then able, at the end of that life, to offer up a perfect sacrifice, a sacrifice that would satisfy divine justice. You see, it was all God's plan. It was all His plan, whereby He was able to justify the ungodly. You see, God is a righteous God and he must deal with sin. He cannot overlook it. He cannot just forget about it. He cannot wink at it. Or, as we might say today, he cannot brush it under the carpet. It's offensive to him, and he must deal with it. And he did. He dealt with it upon our substitute, Jesus Christ. There on the cross, the sins of mankind were imputed unto him. He was there as a sin-bearer. He was there taking the punishment that rightly was due mankind. Mankind had sinned. Mankind must pay. Jesus stood in the room and place of mankind, 
And there God poured out his holy wrath upon Jesus Christ the Lord. Now, here, friends, is the Christian gospel. Here it is. God is prepared to accept someone else as our substitute, as our deputy. Isn't that wonderful? You are required to obey the law of God, but you cannot. But someone else has done it on your behalf. Who is that? It is Jesus Christ the Lord. What must you do then to benefit from his life, his death, his resurrection? You must believe upon him. You must believe that he is the only begotten Son of God, and you must have him as your Lord and Savior. You must follow him, and you must hear the gospel call which tells you to repent. What does that mean, sir? I don't hear that word too often today. Well, it tells you to turn your back upon your old life, your old sinful life. Turn your back upon it. Turn your back upon your blasphemy. Turn your back upon your unbelief. Turn your back upon your idolatry. Turn your back upon your fornication and your adultery. Turn your back upon your lying and your cheating. Turn your back upon all your sins. Take up the cross and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, sir. Follow him. That's our only hope. It's to be found in him, that one who suffered and died in the room and in the place of sinners. And friends, I'm delighted to be able to tell you this afternoon that he will receive you. This is why we come out, in order that you might be familiar with this person, that you might recognize your need, and that you might see that God, in his wonderful grace and mercy, has provided a divine substitute, and he will receive you. Yes, you must come to him. That's why he says, that's why he says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Is this not what you want, sir, madam? Rest? Oh, to have a restful and a peaceful conscience, to know that you're right with God, to know that if you were called into eternity tonight, you would be found righteous in the sight of God. Why? Because you have a Savior. You have a Savior who has fulfilled the law of God on your behalf, and you have received His righteousness. He has taken upon Himself your sins. He has suffered and died in your room and in your place, and He has given to you His wonderful, divine, pure righteousness. That's what we find in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's what's freely available to all of us. It doesn't matter our background. It doesn't matter our education. It doesn't matter how much money we do have or we don't have. It doesn't matter our sex, whether we be male or female. It doesn't matter about the color of our skin. It doesn't matter about what language we speak, because we're all made in the image of God. We've all come from Adam, and the Bible tells us not to flatter us, but to inform us, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. You know, you will recognize this in our society today. Everybody seems to highlight and want to highlight differences between people, between the sexes, between the languages, between the different colors of skin, between people who are well-educated and people who are not so well-educated, between the rich and the poor, the old and the young. Everybody is noticed by their differences. Well, the Bible tells us, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I could go anywhere in the world with this message and if I was able to speak a foreign language like 
in France or Italy or Japan or China, if I was able to speak that language, I could go there and say exactly the same what I'm saying here. Because, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, regardless of where we're from, regardless of our background, we've all sinned. And as far as God is concerned, we're, we are in need of the Savior, the Savior that He Himself has provided. Think on that just for a moment before we draw our first session to a close. Think on that. God is the one who has been offended by our behavior, by our speech, by our actions, by our thoughts. Yet God is the one who at great pains and at great cost has provided a way of salvation. What does salvation mean? Salvation means freedom, liberty, to be emancipated, to be set free, to be set free from the guilt and from the power and ultimately, friends, from the very presence of sin in eternity forever and ever and ever. That's what God has done for us, for mankind in the gospel. Is it not wonderful that the God we have offended has, has been so proactive and provided a Savior, even His only begotten Son? We're here from Partick Free Church of Scotland continuing, and we do pray that the Lord might be pleased to bless His Word to you this afternoon. We're here from Partick Free Church of Scotland continuing. We're a local congregation. We meet at 2 Thornwood Terrace. If you go up Dumbarton Road, you will come to the police station. Well, opposite the police station, if you go up the hill there, you'll come first of all to Thornwood Primary School, and then you'll see our building there at the crossroads next to the school. And we would extend a warm welcome to you to come along any Lord's Day. Now, what day is that? Well, it's the first day of the week. It's Sunday, because that's the day when Jesus rose victorious over the grave. We meet at 11 a.m., and we also meet in the early evening at 6 p.m. We also have a midweek meeting on Wednesday at 7.30 p.m., and we would extend a warm and sincere welcome to you to attend any of these services that open to the public. We are a Scottish registered charity, and we firmly believe we have nothing to be ashamed of. We simply want to present the claims of the Lord Jesus Christ to you. We're not ashamed of Him. In fact, we delight in Him. We love Him because He is our Lord and He is our Savior. And we have no other motive other than to make Him known in this wicked and corrupt generation that we find ourselves in, a generation that largely has forsaken the Word of God and the teachings of the Bible and the Christian gospel. But we feel it is incumbent upon us to be able to come out and even for a few moments as you pass by to remind you that there is a God in heaven who does as He pleases, a God who is absolutely sovereign, a God who has foreordained whatsoever comes to pass, and He has foreordained that we should be here this afternoon and that you should hear something of the Christian gospel in order that you might make a positive response to that gospel. The gospel basically is to repent and to believe the gospel, 
We find it in the Old Testament, and we find it in the New Testament. The prophet Isaiah tells us, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. And as we keep on saying, Isaiah was not in any sense directing people to himself when he said, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. He is telling us to look to the Savior whom God would provide. And who is that Savior? Well, that Savior is the Son of God, the one who is God, the second person in the Trinity, God the Son, and the God the Son took it upon himself to come down to this world at the appropriate time in order that he might undertake all that was appointed for him in order to save mankind. Now, how could he possibly do that? Well, he couldn't do it in heaven. No, he couldn't save you in heaven. He had to come to this earth, and he had to become just like us. Why? Well, mankind has sinned, and mankind must pay the penalty. And that's what Jesus did on our behalf. And mankind must obey the law of God. We cannot because of sin, but the Lord Jesus Christ, taking upon himself our form and nature, became like us, and he lived that perfect life that we couldn't live. And therefore, we look to him for that one who has provided everything required in order to satisfy the just demands of God's most holy and inflexible law. And what a message it is, friends. What a comfort it is to bring this message to you, that in amongst all our sin and all our misery, yet there's a way to be reconciled to God. Now, as you're passing by, you might well be saying to yourself, well, I don't really believe what that preacher is saying at all. Why do you not believe? Well, I'll tell you one reason why you don't believe. The heart is the problem. Your heart is the problem. Jeremiah tells us, that's one of the Old Testament major prophets, he tells us something about our hearts, something that, that we need to know, something that we need to factor in when we're considering the gospel. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Now, he's not just describing his own heart, and we might also say he's not just describing wicked criminals who are locked up in prison. He is describing the heart of every single individual without exception. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? As we pass by here this afternoon, that's the Bible's verdict upon your heart. And when you dismiss the Word of God, it's your heart deceiving you. Your heart is telling you, well, I'm not really that bad as the Bible makes out. I recognize I'm not perfect. I'm not going to deny that, but I'm really not as bad as the Bible would have me. Well, what are we going to listen to? Are we going to listen to our hearts that are sinful, or are we going to listen and receive the infallible Word of God, this Word that has come down from heaven for us, in order that we might know why we're here, how to live, how to be saved, and how to die, and how to end up in heaven in eternity. This is what the Bible would teach us. Now, are we going to listen to our hearts that tell us everything's all right? Are we going to listen to our hearts that tell us, well, God is merciful, is He not? Therefore, He's going to have mercy upon me. That's what your heart says. 
But the Bible tells us God is only merciful in and through the Lord Jesus Christ, in and through the way that He has provided. And we would say that He has provided a way whereby we can be saved at a great cost. It took the Son of God to leave heaven, to leave the realms of glory. It took the Son of God to humble Himself. It took the Son of God to take the form of a man, even a servant. And it took the Son of God to die a death, the most horrible death possible, crucifixion on a cross. All of this was required in order that He might pay the penalty for mankind's sin. And therefore, when your hearts tell you that your sin is not as bad as it really is, it's deceiving you. You need to look at things through the Bible. You need to get what we would call biblical spectacles. You need to look at life. You need to look at your own life, your own heart, through the spectacles of God's Word, which will indeed inform us of our true condition. That's why Paul says, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Here, that, does that not smash our self-righteousness immediately? For there is no difference. You might be religious. The Bible says, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You might be rich, you might be famous, you might be well-educated, you might have degrees after degrees. The Bible says, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You might hold a respectable position in society. You might be a minister of the gospel. You might be a judge. You might be a policeman. <coughs> you might be a shopkeeper. You might be a very influential businessman. You could be a banker. You could be many things. You could be a doctor or a dentist. You could be a surgeon or a consultant or a college lecturer. You could be at any number of occupations. What does the Bible say? For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You could be the chief of sinners. You could be a prostitute. You could be a drunkard. You could be a drug dealer. You could be a murderer. You could be a fornicator. The Bible says, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And therefore, what we seek to say to you today is, it's applicable to us all, because as far as God is concerned, we are guilty. There is none righteous, no, not one. The wages of sin is death. We're sinners. That's why we die physically. And if our sin is not dealt with in this world, and we die in our sins, we will die spiritually and eternally. The wages of sin is death. But, and here's a wonderful but, a but that you should embrace, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, when you get your wages at the end of the week or at the end of the month, when you get it, it's a reward. It's payment. You've worked for it, and you look forward to it, and you will spend it. It's yours. You've earned it. Well, exactly the same can be said about sin. The wages of sin 
is death. That's what sin provides ultimately. There would be no death in this world if there was no sin. And all our problems can ultimately be traced to this fact that sin has entered in to mankind's existence. And ever since that time, we've had death. It has become normal, but it is not natural. It's only normal because sin is normal among us. But friends, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Do you see the difference? Sin produces death, but God gives a gift, and that gift gives life. And what is that gift? Well, ultimately, that gift is His Son. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you see that gift, friends? Sin, what does it bring? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. He gives it. It's a free gift. It's bound up in His Son. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Now, what are you going to do with this gift that God has given to mankind? It is a pleasure and a privilege to be able to come out and to introduce this person to you and to speak of him and to tell you of his willingness to save. He says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Is that not wonderful? A divine gift, rest, peace for your soul. Is that not wonderful? That's what we get when we call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's what you must do, because it's not enough just to hear about Him. You must receive Him. How can we explain this? Well, we can easily explain it. You're hungry. You go into a restaurant or a cafe. You're hungry. You want something to eat. You order some food. It's given to you. It's on your table. You have your knife and fork there before you. Now, the food is lovely. It's, you've got a, it's got a great smell, a great aroma, and you want to eat it to, to, in order to feed your hunger but it will do you no good unless you actually eat it, unless you actually use your knife and fork and put the food into your mouth. Well, so it is with the Savior. You can hear about Him. You can hear about how He's willing to save. You can hear about how He has saved countless millions and is still saving countless millions. But the only way He can save you is when you receive Him. What does it mean to receive Him? It means to cast yourself upon Him. It means to receive Him as Lord and Savior. It means to submit before Him, to recognize that He is who He claims to be. He is the Son of God. He is the one who has come from heaven. He is the one who did suffer and die, and He's the one who went into the tomb and stayed there on the Friday night and all day Saturday, but in the early hours of the first day of the week, He came forth from the grave. Yes, is that not marvelous? Here we have a wonderful message. Christ Jesus, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. That's what He's done by His life, by His death, by His resurrection. And now, friends, what happens? He sits at God's right hand there 
on the very throne of the universe, waiting for that day when he shall return in power and in glory. Oh, you didn't realize he will come back. You thought that you can live your life without any reference to Christ. But friends, we're waiting for that day. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. You will see him, friends. You can run away from, from him today. You can bury your head in the sand for a period of time, but you will see him. You will stand before him. Even if you're dead for thousands and thousands of years, you'll hear the voice of the Lord Jesus, and he will call you forth out of your grave, and the dust of your body shall be reconstituted, and you shall stand before him in your flesh, and you will give account. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in the body according to that he hath done, Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We persuade men, women and boys and girls, to come to him, to make their peace with God through him, because he is our peace. Do you have peace today? Many people will try to find peace in alcohol, or taking some drugs so that they don't face up to reality. But when the high is over, they're back down to square one again, and all the problems they have are there. The heartache is still there. The sin is still there. They don't have the peace. They don't have joy. They don't have the love of God in their hearts. They don't have that certainty concerning eternity. They've got that fear of death. What must you do? Come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn aside, repent, and believe the gospel. God commands all men everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. No one can deny that there was an historical person named the Lord Jesus Christ, and that he suffered and died, and that he was put in a tomb, but that he also arose no one can deny it. No one has ever taken us to the tomb. Why? Because he's not in the tomb. And those who deny the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, it would be very easy for them to prove that the resurrection was a fake if they would just give us the body of the Lord Jesus. They cannot. No, because he's alive and he's alive forevermore. And that same Jesus shall return in like manner. He left when he blessed the disciples, and he gave them the great commission to go into all the world and to teach and to preach the gospel to every creature. And he was taken up right before their very eyes into heaven. Well, this same Jesus shall return in like manner. And when he returns, there shall be that universal day of judgment in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel, Paul says. So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. What a sobering thought to think that we will stand before our Creator. 
and we'll give accounts. Our actions, our words, our thoughts will all be laid bare. I tell you, friends, you will want a Savior on that day. You might well dismiss him today. You might think little of him. You might think that you can live your life without him today. But oh, that day, when eternity is before you, you will want a Savior. You will want to have his righteousness. You dare not stand before God in your own polluted righteousness because you do not have a righteousness that can satisfy God's holy commands and demands. Impossible. And that's why we come out to tell you about this glorious person. Because the Bible teaches us that God made him to be sin for us. He is our substitute. He lived that perfect life. He gave up that perfect sacrifice on behalf of others. That's why it tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It was all part of God's plan. For he, that's God, hath made him, that's Christ, to be sin for us. God was doing something wonderful on the cross. Yes, we know wicked men poured out their hatred and their bile upon the Lord Jesus. We know that. Wicked men did it. The soldiers, Pilate, handed over an innocent man. The crowd demanded, crucify him, crucify him. We will not have this man to reign over us. And they would rather have Barabbas, who was a murderer, released instead of Jesus. And there we see the horribleness and the vileness of the natural man. He hated the Son of God, the perfect man. And would rather a robber and a murderer to be set free instead. Well, what was their great crime? What was the great crime of the Jewish nation? Well, we can sum it up in one word. They rejected Jesus Christ. It was rejection. That was their greatest sin. They rejected the Son of God. Well, friends, we can do exactly the same today. Oh, they're listening, sir. Oh, they are. They don't know what? The light, well, we're trying our best, but no, they are listening. I, I can see them. They are listening because some of them are rejecting. Some of them are shaking their heads. Some of them are saying, that man's mad. And they're shaking their heads. But they are listening. And we're delighted because God's Word does not return unto him void. And we were talking about the Gospel. And the Gospel indeed is what God has done in Christ. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see there, there's a wonderful transaction. Our sins, our guilt, our iniquities, our transgressions are laid upon Christ and he is punished on our behalf. His wonderful, divine, imputed righteousness is given to us. There's the great transaction. And when we're in Christ, God looks upon us and he doesn't see our sin. Instead, he sees the righteousness of Christ. That's what we find in the gospel. And that's why we come out to recommend and commend this Savior to you. 
that you might be found in him on that great and glorious day, that great and terrible day, the day of judgment. We're going to take a short break, but may the Lord be pleased to bless his word to you this afternoon. Hello again. Thank you for joining us at our weekly live stream open air outreach. And this week we're coming from Buchanan Street in the heart of Glasgow City Centre. We're very glad you're able to join with us. We're here from Partick Free Church of Scotland continuing. We are a local congregation and we minister at 2 Thornwood Terrace, Apton Barton Road, and when you come to the police station, opposite the police station, you will find a hill. Go up there and you'll come to Thornwood Primary School and you'll meet our building next door at the crossroads. Please come along any Lord's Day, that Sunday, the first day of the week. Our first meeting is at 11 a.m. and we have an early evening service at 6 p.m. And we also have a midweek meeting on Wednesday evening at 7.30. And these meetings are open to the public. Please come along. Don't be in any sense apprehensive. We would be delighted to see you and we give a warm welcome to every visitor. We're out here in order that we might be enabled to present to you something of the authentic Christian gospel. Sadly, in the day that we find ourselves living in, it's not easy to find the gospel being proclaimed in many, many churches today. They have abandoned the authentic Christian gospel. Well, we're not perfect and never claim to be, but we do want to present to you the claims of Christ as they're found in the Word of God, because we firmly believe that this is what we all need without exception. The Bible tells us there is none righteous, no, not one. We've all, like sheep, we've all gone astray, for there is no difference, for we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all under His wrath and curse as a result. We're all on that broad road that leads to destruction by nature. And unless there's a mighty transformation, unless there's a new life, unless we know that wonderful experience of being born again, and unless we encounter a thorough Christian conversion, then we will end up in a place in eternity called hell. And we're on that road, that broad road, by default. And in order to avoid that terrible end, we must be converted. And we must be converted to the gospel. And we must have a Savior. And we must know what it is to be born again, as Jesus Christ said to Nicodemus. And friends, this is why we come out. We're not after your money. We want to see you reconciled to God and to have that good hope through grace in order that you would be able at the end to be found in Him and to have that place in heaven, in paradise. Now, here's a text for you from God's Word, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the chief. There we have, in a very short verse, we have the essence of the Christian gospel. It's a faithful saying. It's something that we are to declare 
over and over again. We are to make it known. This is something that God would have us to publish and to proclaim. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now, there's a very important thing that has just been said. He came into the world to save sinners. Here, really, is one of our main problems in accepting the Christian message. It is for sinners. And we think so highly of ourselves that we're inclined to think that the message is not for us because we don't regard ourselves as sinners. But we have to look at what the Bible says. We cannot listen to our own hearts. Our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And our hearts will tell us we're not too bad. But the Bible tells us there is none righteous, no, not one. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's God's verdict upon every person. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Here God is reasoning with us. Our sins are ugly in His sight. And our good works, as we might call them, are but filthy rags in His sight. But instead, He has provided a way, a sure way, a certain way, a divine way, in order whereby we can be set free from the power and from the guilt and from the presence of sin through the salvation offered to us in the gospel by the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, this message, this Christian message, is for sinners. And really, this is the first duty that befalls the gospel preacher. He is faithfully, sincerely, and honestly, and respectfully to make people aware that in the sight of God, they are not righteous. They have no inert righteousness in of themselves. We are sinners, sinners by nature, sinners by practice. God has given us a law. He's given us a perfect law. We have it written in our hearts. It's smudged. It's out of focus. It's scarred. It's not what it should be because of sin. That's why He has given it to us in the Bible in codified form. It's written down for us. It's the Ten Commandments. He has given us these commandments. The first commandment is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. We are to worship the one true and the living God. There is no other God, but we have other gods in His place who are no gods at all. What am I talking about? You may well ask. Well, there is the one true and the living God, but we practice idolatry. We don't give to God the place that is due in our lives as we should. The Lord Jesus summed up the Ten Commandments by telling us that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength, and our neighbors as ourselves. Now, I ask you, do you love the Lord your God as Jesus described? Is it not likely that you love yourself more than you love God? Or you might love your spouse or your partner or your children or your grandchildren or your home or your money or your possessions or your entertainment or your sport. If I remember rightly, 
There's a shop down the street. I think it's called the Celtic Store. Does it not say something like this? You live for Celtic? Well, maybe that describes you. Maybe you live for a football team. Maybe you live for something else, for your work, for your money. Well, that's your idol. Whatever takes your time and attention, whatever you devote yourself to, that is your idol. And God says, you are to have no other gods but me. And when we think of other things more than we think about God, that's our idol. And if we've broken this commandment, we've broken all the commandments. Every one of them. We are lawbreakers. We have broken the covenant that God has given to us. We have broken it. We have broken His law. We are guilty before God. And there are no exceptions. And therefore, when this message of hope comes to us, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Our ears should prick up. Why? Because it's a message for you. It's a message for me. It's a message for all of us. Because we're all sinners and God has done something about our sin. He has punished our sin in His only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He has provided a substitute. Because, friends, if we continue in our sinful way, and if we die and our sins have not been dealt with, then we will be punished for our sins. And what will that punishment be? It will be a life in eternity in a place called hell. With the worm it will not die, and the flames they shall not be quenched. That's what awaits the sinner, the unrepentant sinner. It's an eternity to be in with the devil and his angels, that place that has been prepared for the devil and for his angels called hell. Now, we're here this afternoon to tell you it need not be that way. There is another way. There is another place. It's a place called heaven. But here's the important thing. Heaven is a holy place. God is there. Christ is there. The Holy Spirit is there. Holy angels are there. All Christ's people will be there. And we need to be prepared for that place. Because if, and I stress if, if we could get to heaven without being born again, heaven would be hell for us because we have to be changed. We must have this new birth, and we must begin to love the things that God loves, and we must hate sin, because there'll be no sin there. Here in this world, we're surrounded with it. It's normal to us. We've never known anything else. But in heaven, friends, Nothing impure shall enter in. And that's why our sins must be dealt with. And that's why we must know the new birth. And that's why we must be prepared. That's why Jesus said to his disciples, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And he did. He went to the cross, and he prepared that place. Now, friends, here and now, today, he is preparing a people for that place. And if we want to be in heaven, we must have that change. We must have our sins forgiven, and we must be reconciled to God. We must be made fit for it. 
because that place is a holy place. Well, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Yes, friends, he's still saving sinners. He's still saving those who will turn their backs upon their old lives. He's still saving the penitent who will come to Christ. He is still saving them. He still exercises that wonderful role. Yes, very smart, sir, very smart. Yes. Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. There's an exhortation to the young. The young are inclined to be foolish with youth. But friends, old age will soon come. Yes, it does. Youth soon passes. Before you know where you are, it's middle-aged. Before you know where you are, it's old age. And that's why King Solomon said, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. And there's an exhortation to us all to seek the Lord while he may be found, to call upon him while he is near. If we're young, then come to him now. If we're middle age, then come to him now. If we're old age or old aged, then come to him now. This is what we would teach you. This is what the Bible would exhort you. For today is the day of salvation. We only have today. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. Life is very brief. Death is certain. Sin is the problem. And Christ is the cure. We're here from Partick Free Church of Scotland continuing. We're going to draw our time to a close. It's been good to be with you this afternoon. We're very grateful for listening and for the tracts that have been distributed. Please read them. And may the Lord be pleased to bless His Word to you this afternoon.